Well, I, I want to start off by wishing everybody a, uh, a happy new year. And um, I'm proud that you decided to start off the new year here this morning. You know, you could really, you could do anything um, on a Sunday morning, uh, give or take. But, you know, you think it's important to your own well-being, your family's well-being to be here to hear something from God's word. And, um, and I hope that this new year sermon, I mean, it's what this is will um, will be encouraging and it'll give us hope, right? It'll give us, uh, I think, you know, whether you make resolutions or not, you know, whether you have, well, I think that's neither here nor there, but I think that one of the things that God's word shows us, I think one of the things the cross shows us is that there's an important work to do um, in the way that we we live life. There's 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 always something required, not in a legalistic way, but in a, in a, in a true, authentic way, as, as we connect to the Spirit of Christ in us, what we begin to see is that there's always something that's set before our face. And we find joy, and we find meaning, and we find resolve, and we find comfort when we actually set our face toward the things that we should set our face towards. And, and that could be something that is encouraging or that could be something that's really terrifying. It just depends on where you are. Because as humans, we have a really nasty habit of actually not facing the thing that we should face for a lot of reasons. And um, when, you, when you go to God's Word and when you go to the cross, one of the things it teaches us at a basic fundamental level is that um, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that pattern of, of life, suffering, death, and resurrection, um, there comes a point to where we have to face what we don't necessarily want to face. Um, but when you face it and you bear under it and through it in faith, you, you will find, I think, progressively that the very thing that we don't want to face is, is the means that God's going to use to bring about what we most need. The thing that we most often don't want to deal with is the thing that we most often need to deal with to get the thing that we need. That's one of the things that the resurrection or the, the crucifixion or resurrection teaches um, in, in a, just a really applicable way. So today's sermon is called Facing the Serpent. It comes from Matthew 16, 13 through 28, and I'm going to read it and then we'll, we'll pray together. Matthew 16, 13, and I think we kind of, you know, set the stage last week. We reoriented ourselves to Matthew and blessedness with the Sermon on the Mount and a way of being in the world that's contradictory to, I think, ease and comfort and the things that the world builds their life around, right? And so we reoriented oriented ourselves to that last week, and so I think this week we're ready to jump in. Matthew 16, verse 13, now, when Jesus came to the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, okay, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. I'll give you the, kings, the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You're a hindrance to me. For you're not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with the angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death 
until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Let's pray. Lord, when we, when we come to your word, we stand in the middle of a mystery, but we stand on the foundation of truth. And what we want, Lord, is to, is to know you better through your word. And what we want to know what, what, it, what it means to be you and what it means to be us through your word and, and what it means to be human through the person of your son. And, and we want to be able to see through this, through this passage, through this story, a little bit more into what that looks like when we just live and move and have our being and go to work and, and spend time with our kids and our wives and, and, and when we're sick and when we're healthy, when things are really looking up for us or when things aren't looking up so, so up for us. We, we want to know what you have to say. And so we're, we're, we're dependent on you to give us knowledge and to give us the understanding even as I preach, Lord, that, that you would teach me and that you would impart wisdom and knowledge and understanding and, uh, and that we would glorify you with our bodies, with our lives. And, um, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, why, I want to start with a question. Why do we have stories? Have you ever thought of it? it it's actually kind of fascinating to think about that we, you know, we we have stories, and before, you know, writing and the the advent of the printing press and the avail you know the the availability to source all of this this written work down, um, societies existed and thrived through an oral tradition where they actually told stories. Um, stories are a fundamental part of the human existence. And I think one of the reasons we have stories is that stories are able to communicate realities that propositional truths, right, aren't able to fully express. That's one of the reasons that we have stories. They communicate a a depth of meaning that propositional truths can't convey. And the good stories, what they do is they take propositional truth, things that are true about human nature, about life, right? And they characterize those propositional truths. So authors give those truths to a character. And then they take that character and they put that character into a plot. And that character in that plot encounters uh, an an antagonist. They they encounter opportunity. They They encounter heartbreak. They encounter pain. They encounter joy, right? And, and, that, and that character that embodies propositional truth, something that's true about the world, we begin to understand and to feel and experience something about the propositional truth that the character embodies that the propositional truth itself can't fully express without the story. And that's not me or my opinion saying that that's the way this works. That's why we have the Bible. That's why we have the Gospels. It's because that's what the Gospels do. They take propositional truths, right? Christ suffered once for sins. That's a propositional truth. But when you take it and you put it in the framework of the gospel, then, and you see that the eternal logos, which is who is Christ, right? Who is truth. He is truth, the embodiment of truth. When you put him as a character in a story of events, you begin to learn about what the truth actually means and actually is through the story and his reaction to the events. And, and that's especially important for this text because this text right here is full of propositional truths. Here's one. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. It's a propositional truth. What does it mean? Well, that's a great question. It really depends on who you ask. If you ask a Jew you'd get a much different answer than you would if you asked me. And it depends on where somebody is in their faith journey, right? We need the life of Christ to kind of frame this propositional truth. Here's another one. Um, Jesus gives Peter the keys of the kingdom. What does that mean? That's a great question. It depends on who you ask. (laughs) Not even Peter knows what it means. Because if you give Peter just a few verses... You know, 
he's going to act in all kinds of ways that, that have Jesus classify him as a devil. And that's the way it is, is for humans, right? We take things we don't understand and we begin to exercise them. And the next thing you know, the person that has the keys to, to heaven's gate is called the ruler of the underworld. What you bind on earth will have been bound in heaven. Peter has the authority to bind and to loose. What does that mean? It depends on who you ask. It's a propositional truth. Well, this, prob- this text presents a major, major problem. And the major problem is not whether, you know, it's, it's not whether Peter is a pope. And it's not, you know, whether is, is this, is Peter, is, is we're going to build the church on Peter? Are we building the church on this rock or that rock? You know, is he talking about Peter's role in the first uh, gospel sermon or, or Peter's role in, in, ex, in offering Gentiles acceptance into what was otherwise a primarily Judaistic Jewish kingdom? You know, that's not necessarily, I think, the main issue with this text. That's not the problem this text presents. The problem this text presents is that in one breath, you have Jesus Christ naming somebody as a gatekeeper, as a key holder with absolute authority to bind and to loose, and in the next breath, he calls him the devil. That's the problem that this text presents to us. And what we're going to see is that it's not, a, it's not necessarily a problem with Peter. It's a problem with us. It's a human problem. It's a deeply human problem. But the one who receives the keys to the kingdom of heaven is called the ruler of Hades. And what I think this story does is it kind of helps us get to the crux of what's going on here and what the message of the text is by using Peter as a character in a story that embodies a whole lot of things. He is a person. Doesn't mean he's a, you know, fictitious character. He's a person, but he embodies all sorts of ideals and thoughts and emotions and actions. And, and you have him characterized in two different ways. Like, there's the first one, Matthew 16, 13 through 20. You know, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but, but my Father who is in heaven. You know, so he's, he's characterized as someone who's blessed um, because of the way, because of the, ep- the epistemology of, of the discovery, which is, which is also fascinating. Because he doesn't use the scientific, you know, Peter comes to this conclusion in a way that most um, academic people would be very, really suspicious of. He doesn't consult peer-reviewed sources. This isn't a scientific experiment here where he has control and variables, and he's able to run that through a few couple of hundred times, and now he has scientific evidence that says, you are the Messiah, you're the Christ. We're talking about divine revelation. And Jesus doesn't say, hey, blessed are you, you got the answer right, even though having the right answer is, you know, implied in the blessing. The blessing is, you're blessed because this actually came from a state of being, namely, in this moment, outside of anything Peter did to deserve it or earn it, there was a collapsing of the divine and the earthly to where Peter knew something that was fundamentally, foundationally true, namely that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the anointed one, the Son of God. And all the blessings that flow from this include a collapsing of the realities of the divine and the earthly realm, which is fascinating because the, you know, Judaism in the ancient Near Eastern world, is different from all the other religions because it doesn't hold to the idea of continuity. Every other ancient Near Eastern religion said, hey, there is a collapsing of the divine and the earthly realm. And I can do things on the earthly realm that impact the divine realm. And then Judaism comes with a, with a call of Abraham. And Abraham is in the middle of a world that's, that's filled with different gods you know, in in the ancient Near East. And he says, there's one God, and he can't be manipulated. And furthermore, the things I do on earth don't have this continuity effect with 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 the things of heaven. 
And so Jesus comes in the New Testament with Peter, and it's fitting because Jesus is the incarnate word. He is the transcendent become imminent, right? It's the fusion of heaven and earth together. And suddenly, Simon Peter is blessed because everything in heaven affects the things on earth, from his binding to his loosing, right? That, that's one of the things that Matthew is showing us, that Jesus' words are showing us, is there's a, there actually now is continuity in the right way. Fascinating. Unless you're a product of the Enlightenment, which most of us are, and now we have to work to figure out how it's fascinating again. But he, Peter gets a new, he gets a new title. He's blessed. He gets a new name. You know, you're Pet, you are, um, you are, you are Peter. He's victorious, right? That the gates of hell will not um, prevail against the community of, of Christ's believers. And, and Peter's given all sorts of authority, binding and loosing, and that's, that's what we see here. And I know you're wondering, how did, you know, as everybody is, how did you get those nice little graphics by the, by the words? Microsoft did it for me. Did it in PowerPoint by itself. I wanted it to do it later, but it wouldn't. Now, we get to the really crux of the, of the text, I think, in Matthew 16, verse 21, what this text is really about. It's less about what Jesus gives to Peter and what Peter does with it than it is this. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. It's Matthew 16, verse 21. So, now we're presented with an even bigger problem. Jesus is the Messiah. He's the Son of God. The issue, however, is that the pathway, right, to victory, Hades' gates will not prevail against Christ's people in the kingdom, right, that, that, to which Peter has keys and binding and loosing authority. There's absolute victory there. But that's one breath, and the next breath is, hey, by the way, I'm going to suffer, I'm going to be awfully mistreated, abused, used, and I'm going to die, but I'm going to be raised again. Well, that kind of gives meaning, I think, to what Jesus, what Jesus is conveying when he says, the gates of Haiti won't prevail against my people, right? I mean, there's, that's something to think about, because gates are in... They're not an offensive weapon, gates are defensive. But when you, when you look at the word Hades here, there, it could be translated Hades or hell, and you look at it from a Greco-Roman perspective, you kind of see, I think, a little bit of what Jesus is getting at. But, you know, Hades is the Greek god of the underworld, right? And, and, and Hades um, isn't really mentioned by the Greeks. They don't want to say his name, but his realm, his realm of authority becomes synonymous with his name, which is Hades. And one of the things that Hades is known for, he doesn't really get involved in the affairs of the living, all right? That's not his deal. But Hades is known for not giving up a single soul that enters into his gates. When they enter the underworld, they're his. That's what he's known for, right? Well, what Jesus is saying here from a Greco Roman perspective is, hey, I'm entering into those gates. I'm going to be right in the middle of Hades and his kingdom, but the gates aren't going to hold me in. They're not going to prevail against me, and they're not going to prevail against anybody that's part of my community, right? But one of the things that implies <laughs> is that the people in his community go to the realm of the underworld because he does. It implies that he has to go there. He's going to go and be barred in Hades gates. It's a metaphor. Think about it. All right? Jesus, he's barred in Hades gates. 
And this power, this rain doesn't give up anything, not one thing. Well, except for Jesus and every one of his followers. And so the Greco-Roman idea of Hades is absolutely defeated. The thing that he's known for, he cannot control. The gates of Hades don't keep God's people in. It, it doesn't prevail. They don't prevail against the church. However, part of the church's experience is in the realm of Hades. Now, that's why I said earlier, when you have to face something that you don't want to face, it could be really exciting or terrifying. It just depends on what you know about it or what position you're in. And, and, the, and the reason I know this is where Jesus is going is because of the way Peter responds to him, all right? Because we have Peter's new characterization um, in verses 22 through 23. He pulls Jesus to the side, right? He says, hey, hey, Christ, can you come into my office? And he pulls Christ into the office. Hey, you know, I didn't want to embarrass you in front of the, I didn't want to embarrass you in front of the group, uh, you know, we got to talk about, about this. He began to rebuke him, right? Which I think is so, fa this word, this is fascinating because you, you know where this word shows up at? One of the, only, maybe it shows up three times in the New Testament, maybe. But the, the, its usage, its identical usage shows up in Jude, Jude 9. When Michael, the archangel, is, is contending with Satan about the body of Moses. Now that's a conversation we want to get involved in, right? What does that look like? But Michael refuses to pronounce a blasphemous word against Satan. And instead he goes, may the Lord rebuke you. And so the reason I bring this up is because what Peter does to Jesus, uh, Michael refuses to do to, the, to Satan. And so he rebukes Jesus. He's trying out his keys. <laughs> you know, I, he has the keys. And so if you've got the keys to the kingdom and you can bind and loose, maybe you can loose your Messiah from the thing that he says he's bound to, namely suffering, mistreatment, death, and resurrection. And so Peter takes his key off his key ring, he puts it in the door, and he gives it a turn. This can't happen to you. Surely not. May the Lord put mercy on you. And then suddenly, Peter gets a brand new character arc, right? Get behind me, Satan. And so the one who's given all authority over Christ's kingdom is now called by Christ the ruler of the netherworld, the ruler of chaos, the ruler of hell. One of the reasons I think he calls him Satan too is because the content of Peter's speech is an, it, it's an echo of, of the serpent's speech in the garden. The content's eerily similar. Satan's message to Adam and Eve is like, oh, you're not going to die. And Peter, Jesus says what he says to Peter, and Peter goes, oh, no, you're not going to die. And so, well, there we have it. Sounding a lot like a character we know about. And so Peter's rebuked. He get, you know, get behind me, Satan. He gets a brand new name. He gets a new position. And he says, Jesus says this, you, you are mindful. You set your mind not on the things of God, but on the things of man. Now, before we're too hard on Peter, how many of you are interested in uh, going to Jerusalem, suffering many things at the hands of the chief priests and the elders? You know, I mean, it's worse than that, right? Like, it, it, it's worse than just Jesus being an absolutely perfect person, enduring an injustice that, that no person should ever endure because, you know, because he, Jesus is a good perf person and a, and a perfect person, but it's, it's everything that we fear as human beings that Jesus experiences. Public hum humiliation. To be humiliated. Public humiliation by the people who claim to love you. 
public humiliation by your tradition. Betrayal. A death that's a death that's designed to torture the absolute worst criminals. And when there's an opportunity to, to, to release or to, to be saved, the people in power, the people in authority, the people that are supposed to execute justice, release a criminal instead of you. So we got to cut Peter a little bit of slack because no one wants to face what Peter faces or what, or what Peter's faced with. And that's the point. That's the point of the text. And what Jesus shows us, this is, a, this is a secondary lesson to the sufferings of Christ because Christ suffered once and all for, for sins that he might bring us to God and we are saved by grace through faith, right? Through that sacrifice. No one can make that sacrifice but Jesus. And so we gotta say that before we start this part. But one of the things that Jesus shows us is that the, the pathway to overcoming Hades, right? Destruction, chaos in our life. The, that path, part of it is the ability to actually look and accept, look at and accept the things we don't want to look at and accept. That, that's part of this, that's part of what the cross is. It confronts our propensity to run from the thing that we don't want to face. That's what this text is about. And what Jesus says is that keys to the kingdom aren't meant to lock doors that we don't want to go through. They're meant to unlock them so that we can go through them. I think that's the point. Because what he says next after he gets finished with characterizing Peter, he says, if anyone would follow me, this is verse 24, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. This is what this text is about. It's about a way of being in the world, empowered and dwelt by the Holy Spirit that helps us get our heads around the undeniable and unavoidable reality of suffering and pain. And the Bible doesn't deal with it by removing it. It deals with it by empowering the people that follow Christ to face it. And as they face it and walk through the pain, what they figure out is what they once thought that was the source of the pain is the key to unlocking the growth and the blessedness and the oneness we have with Christ as we suffer. And so suddenly suffering, in a, and, I, and I don't say this lightly. This isn't lightly. This is serious. What I'm saying is serious. It becomes the means that we begin to experience victory and growth and Christ-likeness and courage and healing. And that's hard, man. And what the cross teaches us is that unless you get on it, you, the only way, this is the, the only way to avoid the cross is to get on it. You can't go through the altar. You can't go around the altar, right? Death and suffering is not some cyclops, right, that's inhabited this cave. <laughs> and you're this traveler, right, and you got your sword here, and you're like. 
That's the Cyclops. Ah! Right? In, in this story, it, it, it's, the metaphors are clear, right? The Cyclops is the thing I don't want to face. It's my fear. It's the thing that's going to eat my face off. And I'm afraid that I can't stand up to the Cyclops, right? And if this is a good story and this is a, this is a comedy and not a tragedy, well, what's going to happen? Well, that Cyclops has got to go down, or I do. But the victory comes through that. Now, what we do as humans is we, we look for fur so that we can dress up like a baby Cyclops, you know? And the Cyclops is going, rrr, rrr, Cyclops. And we're like, <laughs> who, who are you? I'm baby Cyclops. Okay. It's a cute baby. Rrr, rrr, you know, and then we, we kind of go along the side and we, and we skirt around the Cyclops. Well, that's not the way that it works. It doesn't work that way. And that's what, it, I mean, look at, you know, Numbers 21, 4 through 9, right? That's what a great example. Numbers 21, Israel's in the Exodus, and, you know, they're grumbling, complaining, you brought us out here to die, and God responds to them by sending them fiery serpents to bite them. And when the fiery serpents bite them, what do they do? You know, they, they're, you know, and they die. And then they go to Moses, and they go, hey, <laughs> can you do something about these snakes? Take them away. And what does God do? He says, okay. Take, a, um, you know, take some bronze and, a, and, and fashion a snake, cast it in bronze, set it on a pole so that whenever somebody's bit, they can look at the pole and they'll be healed. Well, that's not the way we want God to deal with the problem at all, right? Just take away the snakes, man. Good gracious. And what does God do? Well, instead of taking away the snake, he's like, we'll make a, you know, erect a representation of it. And every time a snake bites, you just look at it. Well, what's the meaning in that? Well, one of the meanings is that God doesn't, he, he's not necessarily in the business of him taking away the things that we want him to take away. He's in the business of taking the thing that you fear the most, the thing that's there when there's no faith. That's probably why. He sent serpents. It's because in the story of Genesis, um, what do you have when there's no faith in Adam and he, on their part? You have a snake. And then so you got Israel in the same condition. When there's no faith, you're just left with a serpent. It's going to bite you and kill you. And we're deathly afraid of snakes as humans. But what he says is, look, put it on a pole and look at it. I'm not taking the snakes away. You have to to look at it. You have to face it. And Jesus gets to the Garden of Gethsemane and he cries and, he, and he's heard. The Hebrew writer tells us that he's heard. When he offers up pleas for, for, for help and for mercy, he's heard because of his humble reverence. If it's possible, take this cup away. And God says, you have to look at the cup. You have to look at the snake. Because one of the, and then one of the, but what comes from that is actually something that's better than if you don't. And, and we see that here too. Right? After Jesus talks about suffering, death, pain, all the stuff, he takes time to tell us this kind of stuff, right? Because you're like, what is he saying this for? The Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he's done. Chapter 17. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain. He was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun. What's Matthew doing? He's showing us that Jesus' descent into the underworld didn't taint him. It was part of what God used to make him glorious. That's what they see on the mountain. They see a, a picture. They see a, 
a theophany of the would-be risen Christ after his battle with hell and with death and with Hades, and he's a lot better looking after he goes through it than he was when he was talking about going through it. That's why that's there. It's so that we can look at it and go, okay, there's something to this for me. I don't have to avoid the thing that I'm scared to death to confront. Because if I confront it, there's a really strong possibility that when I look at the snake, the venom will go away and things will get better. Because things don't get better when you try to go around the altar. Don't we see that in Cain? Bitterness, envy, resentment. Abel's accepted. Cain's not, you know. And oh, that he could be. Just accept me. Well, Cain doesn't get to go around the altar. His life takes him through it. And ours does too. And Jesus' message is, is, is in, in the the message that Jesus gives us, right, to, to follow him is not merely just, hey, just do it. It's, which is why I think you have the first of it, you have this collapsing of the divine and the heavenly, is that when you do, you find him there. God is near to the brokenhearted, and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. That's where he is. I mean, look at, about, look at it from, look at it from the, the concept of art, right? You know, we're not, we're not a Catholic, but if you go into a Catholic church, where's Jesus? Some of you were former Catholics. Where would he be? On a cross. What, is that, what does that symbol teach? It teaches you where to find him. That's what, it, that's what the art does, right? It, it, it's instructive. And that's why art exists, like stories. It reinforces propositional truth. If you let it, and you can look at it and go, okay. If I find him there, then that's where I have to be. That's where I get to be. That's the thing. We make the jump. But it's not where we want to be. But God is so gracious and kind, right? And the reminder he gives us is this. It's a simple reminder. Set your things, not on the things of man, but on the things of God, right? Peter is blessed. Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah. When's that word used? It's used in the Beatitudes. Blessed, blessed. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the peacemakers, right? Um, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are those who are gonna experience a way of being that's completely different than most people are in the world. Blessed are you when people persecute you and treat you spitefully and and utter all kinds of things about you on my account. Blessed are you for, for great is your reward in heaven. That's what you get in Matthew 5. And you get to Matthew 6, he just says, look, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. And, and when you get to Matthew 16, the message isn't all that different. You're not setting your, thought, your mind on the right things. So, what you get when you face the serpent, because, you know, Jesus says in John three fourteen, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so too must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son in the world to condemn the world, but that the world through, might be saved through him, right? And so that's what you get in John 3 and 15 and 16 and 17. You, you get this invitation to look to Christ and to be where he is and to actually have faith and courage that you'll find him there in anything that has to go on the cross, whether it be resentment, whether it be envy, whether it be a conversation with someone who has wronged you, whether it be a conversation with someone that you have wronged, whether it be 
uh, a fear that has taken so much control of your life that it's made you antisocial, whether it be loneliness, wh- whatever it is, right? Whatever it is that you want to just go away, that I want to just go away. You know, when, 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 when we have the, the, the faith to actually step into it, we're, we'll find Christ there. And then the continuity will happen, right? And, and, and then suddenly, the, all the solutions that, you know, the peer-reviewed articles gave us or what they said about this or what they said about that, the flesh and blood, that passes away. And God works a mighty work when you're in that moment. And it's hard to describe what the work is until you're in that moment. It's a deeply intense and personal work. And there's a lot of healing that, that, that happens in that moment. But there's a lot of courage and strength that you get from that moment. And you're, and you're ready to take the next moment, right? Until you got, you got Isaac laid bare on the altar there. And your and you're knife's in the air. But you know good and well that, hey, there, there's the only, there's, what I found out is that if I make the sacrifice, I never make it. If I lose my life, I save it. Then faith becomes sight. Hades is overcome. You get a new body that's not sick. A place, a a family, part of a a universal family where Christ is the victor. You no longer know in part. You know fully as you are fully known, right? What am I describing? Death. And so what Christ would bid us to do is Bonhoeffer said a long time ago, right? When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. (laughs) But in that death, there's just life. That's all I've got. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word, for its ability to build us up. Help it to make sense in our hearts and in our minds. Help us to make sense in our lives. This year, Lord, may it be marked with courage that we're able to look at the cross, that we're able to to put ourselves on it and and the things that, you know, we don't want to deal with, the things we've been putting off, the things we know that we should encounter that that make us afraid and we're afraid of the shame or the scorn or or whatever it is, you know. And, And so please help us, God, to look to Christ in his sacrifice, to receive the finished work by faith, and that justification that comes by faith, and knowing that we, because of Christ, there's nothing we have to prove to you. You accept us fully, and all there's left is finding life in the face of death. And I pray you would help us to do that this morning, Lord, and I pray that, you know, you would call us into a a way of being in the world that's in line with who you are, that where you reign and rule in us, that it's no longer, as Paul would say, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me and the life I live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And I pray you would help us to, to live that life. You give us eyes to see that. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.